I had a giant power surge. Hey, Meats, good to see you. And everything just glitched. <laughs> but we're back on. Um, so, again, welcome to Sabbath Collective, a community of people interested in celebrating the Sabbath and pursuing God through a Hebraic worldview of the Bible. So we're going to begin our time with the lighting of the Shabbos candles. And traditionally, the mothers usually light the candles, which connects us to the Sabbath light of peace, of joy, and of unity. And so as we do this tonight, we're going to just remember again that this is the Shabbos. I know for Ryan and Anita, they're already in the Shabbos. <laughs> hey, Odin, great to see you. Shabbat Shalom. Good to see you. Good. G glad everyone's still there. I had some kind of giant uh, transformer glitch. Uh, and so again, this connects us to the lights of peace, of joy, and of unity. And then she circles her hands around the, the candles three times, which is a gesture to welcome in the Sabbath. The Lord is our light and our salvation. May his light be felt in this space as the enlightenment of truth and radiance of joy. Amen. Well, for those of you who have been human for a little bit, hey, Jean, great to see you. You probably have figured out that human ways are almost always about the swinging pendulum. So in other words, whether it's about diet or safety or to-dos, we normally swing from one extreme to the other. And what happens is, is we notice that something needs help, and so we make a lot of rules to help it, and then the pendulum goes from one side to the other side. And so we become kind of toggled between extremes back and forth. So we see this with the concept of purpose. In the time, this became the hot topic that conference speakers extolled and books sold in the millions. Uh, at the time, many people lived sort of passionless lives maybe serving no real purpose other than to pay their bills. They sort of bought into the mindset that you just had to keep your head down, work real hard, and one day you'll be happy and maybe retire and sit on your front porch. And for many people, that was a fairly meaningless life. So the pendulum moves and enters the paradigm of purpose. And purpose is that thing that you've been made for. This is what uh, we learned from this and that that thing that once you do find it, it will transform you. You will be happy, you will be fulfilled, and maybe help other people too. So people weren't just purpose-driven. It was also purpose-driven organizations, churches, businesses, committees. Uh, I remember a while back, I tried to volunteer to drive people to the stores because a lot of times elderly people get sort of trapped without vehicles where they can't get to stores, so they end up you know, shopping at their corner store and not getting good value for their money and not getting good food. So there was an organization that one of the many things they did was uh, drive elderly people to the grocery store, help them get their groceries back home. And so I went to volunteer, and the young lady who was inter interviewing me said, well, first, tell me your personality type so I can make sure you're fulfilling your purpose. And so I felt a little smirk come up on my face. And I went, well, you know, my personality type is the type that wants to drive the elderly to grocery stores so that they can get affordable food. <laughs> but this is what we've kind of fallen into, right? And now this purpose-driven obsession for some people was actually a good thing thing. It sort of sent them in the right direction. But for other people, there became this ongoing, wait, what is my purpose? And let me see a thumbs up if you've ever felt this, like this big pressure when the purpose conversation <laughs> came up. Like when people ask you, what's your purpose? What do you put on this planet to do? And you just were like a deer caught in the headlight, right? What if I can't find my purpose? What's wrong with me? Or what if I'm passionate about more than one purpose and don't want to get stuck do doing only one purpose? Uh, if I don't figure out the purpose I'm supposed to do in the world, maybe God will be disappointed in me. Maybe he'll take back my gifts. You've heard that, right? 
If you don't use them, you'll lose them. And I'll be unfulfilled and miserable. And the thing that I was sent here on this earth to do will never get done. So that's sometimes some of this pressure that comes with this vision and this this drive for purpose and finding purpose. Another unintended consequence, which is pretty interesting, is finding purpose can sometimes create tunnel vision resulting actually in a loss of wonder. Finding purpose can sometimes create tunnel vision resulting in a loss of wonder. Uh, Jean says it's like life is a pop quiz. Exactly. And you get that test freeze, right? (laughs) It's so true. So this is oftentimes what happens when we get kind of trapped into this type of pressurized purpose vision. It literally gives us tunnel vision uh, because there's no time for dilly-dallying, right? When you get into this really narrow focus on purpose, uh, it's all about fulfillment of purpose because if it isn't purposeful, what the teaching that goes along with this says is it's a time stealer. So in other words, sitting on a beach was good if maybe you were doing it for vitamin D or maybe you wanted to get some nice earthing or maybe you wanted to swim because all that's for health. But sitting on the beach is a waste of time to just sit on the beach for nothing and do nothing. So the sense of purpose becomes a real taskmaster. It drives people and it condemns people, really. And if you've ever spent some time talking with someone who really has this purpose focus, I mean the kind, you know, with the with the pinpoint eyes, right? They're really not aware of anything else. And sometimes I'll be having conversations with these types of folks and they'll just be riveted to what I'm saying. They're in the purpose paradigm and they're very interested in what I'm talking to them about because what they feel is perhaps this can help them in their purposeful vision. And so they're paying attention, they're listening. Maybe it's that you know people, or maybe that you have some ideas or whatever it is, they're laser focused on you, right? And filled with questions. Hey, Derek, great to see you. Hey, Sissy, good to see you. Shabbat Shalom. They're just filled with questions, right? But then you switch the topic. And the minute you switch the topic from what they're, they have their purposeful vision on, you've lost them. And out comes the phone. And you think, wait, were we connected at all? Or was it just like this vampire thing that came and sucked all my energy and filled you up and now that you're done, I'm done. So I'm not saying purpose is a bad thing by any means. But again, purpose has gotten a little to the extreme. And so again, as we were saying, here comes the pendulum swing. Uh, So something else arises. I was recently in Taiwan and I see my son and daughter-in-law, right, and Anita are watching now. I was recently in Taiwan for a few months, spending a few months with my son and daughter-in-law for the birth of their first child, my first grandbaby. And what a thing. (laughs) Now, I knew exactly why I was going. I went the month ahead of when Anita was going to have the baby, and then I was going to have two months after. And I knew exactly why I was going. I had a list in my head. I was going to totally support my kids before the birth, as they had just moved to Taipei from New York City. There were new jobs and They would be new parents and there was a new home and there was reconnection with families and so much going on. So I was gonna be a practical help to them. I was gonna cook and I was gonna clean and I was gonna organize and I was gonna let Anita sleep by watching our little one. I was gonna deepen my relationship and my understanding of the Taiwanese culture uh, as this would be my granddaughter's life and my son's as well. And also, I was going to connect more with my daughter-in-law's family, as they're my son's family and my granddaughter's family. And I had only met them a few times, and certainly not all of them. 
And I was going to also help them to get set up in a natural, green, organic lifestyle in Taiwan. These were my purposes. Well, it wasn't long before I realized I may not be able to fulfill my purpose to the extent I had thought. <laughs> okay, research in another country is really challenging when you're not searching in the native language. Ordering is also somewhat difficult if you're looking for things that are not readily available in the country. Finding comparable things is a big learning curve. Understanding another culture that is very different from yours when you don't speak the language is really a bit of a thing. Even when there is communication, because perhaps somebody speaks English, there, there's still a good chance of miscommunication because of words or inflection or cultural understanding. So it isn't this sort of free-flowing exchange where you just chill and dialogue. Conversation actually has to be pretty intentional and even methodical. Now, not if you're speaking Chinese, <laughs> but if you're speaking English. And then for a month after my granddaughter was born, my kids had a beautiful opportunity to stay in a postnatal care center that was more in the heart of the city. And they took this opportunity and it was an excellent decision. Uh, the mother is taken care of. This is a beautiful Asian culture that I wish we saw this in the United States. The mother is nurtured and supported and taken care of and fed very healthy foods to support her healing. Uh, and my son actually worked in the same building as the postnatal center, so there was no two-hour round trip for him for the commute. So it was beautiful for them. But wait, I was going to do that. And then also, it was about a two hour trip from them staying in their house, which was a beautiful mountain area, but far away from the postnatal center. And again, not a lot of English around me. So I wanted to help them. And I'm not doing what I thought I would to help. Now, to visit my granddaughter, I would have to take two buses and a bit of a walk in between the two buses. And I developed a deep and intimate relationship with my Google Translate app, although it sometimes struggled with the Chinese characters too. I couldn't really connect with people like I usually do, which is normally it's pretty effortless for me to connect with people, even when I don't know anyone. I still always usually feel connected. But I was very different and I was separate. Although the people were lovely and warm and sweet and helpful, I wasn't a part. The language separated. So am I bringing any value to this situation, me being in Taiwan? Am I, what is my purpose? Am I bringing any value? But ah, then it hit me. If I really wanted to connect with my daughter's family and with my children as new parents, I say my children, my son and my daughter-in-law, as new parents, with my neighbors whose language I didn't speak, and with all the different customs and food around me, even with my own self, I had to let go of my agenda and not be about what I could bring someone or even teach someone. I had to forget finding purpose and become curious. And curiosity in English is a strong desire to learn about something. It's an interest, the definition says, leading to inquiry. Einstein calls this curiosity holy curiosity. And I began to follow after curiosity and forget about purpose. I began to ask tons of questions. And if I pass by something, uh, that seemed interesting on the street, instead of saying, oh, I don't know what's going on here, I'm in another country and I'm not part of this, I would stop. I would look because the people in Taiwan don't care about that. They don't care about what you're doing. They're in their own thing and they don't care. You can do whatever and they're not bothered by it. it you know, you know what I'm saying, within reason. <laughs> so I would stop and I would look 
and I would get my phone out and I would put the translate on what was going on and then I would Google it to understand it. And I learned to linger and even stop and interrupt where I was going if I noticed something that was new or I wanted to learn about something. And you know what? People smiled at me. And sometimes they motioned to me to join them. And, and with hand gestures, they would explain to me what they were doing. And a lot of that was religious traditions. And they would explain to me with hand gestures. My curiosity became my driving force. I began to watch people closely with no purpose at all, really. I learned without being able to understand the language about customs and food and the city's history and nature. I was went deep into the nature. I was to learn how to be curious first, once again. And it connected me even deeper with those around me. And even with myself, as I was able to get very focused on my own health and fitness, because I had no agenda other than connection. I watched everyone around me. I asked a lot of questions and I learned from all of them with love. I've read that an interesting person is an interested person. And I noticed when I started to ask more questions, people seemed much more connected with me. And possibly that was because as I'm asking, as I'm interested, in them, then I become interested. In the ancient Hebrew writings, the Perkei Avot, Ben Zoma asks, who is wise? And his answer, the one who learns from all people. First Samuel shows us a really interesting uh, example of a priest in the temple who was not curious, <laughs> no curiosity here. He had his agenda. He was comfortable to know life the way he had always experienced it. And if if you're if you have a, a text handy, um, I use the uh, complete Jewish version, and I'm going to be looking at First Samuel. Um, he was comfortable to know life the way he experienced it. He lived in his agenda box. And then there was Hannah, who was a woman who had a completely broken heart, as she wanted a child desperately. And so she goes to the temple to pour, Rebecca, great to see you, honey, Shabbat Shalom. She goes to the temple to pour out her heart to Yahweh. And in 1 Samuel 1, 9 through 17, it says, Eli the Cohen was sitting on his seat by the doorpost of the temple of Adonai. In deep depression, she prayed to Adonai and cried. Then she took a vow and said, Adonai, if you will notice how humiliated your servant is, if you will remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a male child, then I will give him to Adonai for as long as he lives, and no razor will ever come on his head. I don't have the time to explain why she prayed that prayer, but just know that she was brokenhearted, and this prayer, she believed, was almost as if her life depended on it, okay? The text goes on, she prayed for a long time before Adonai, and as she did so, Eli was watching her mouth. Again, Eli was the priest sitting over on the corner. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Her lips moved, the text says, but her voice could not be heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Eli said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Stop drinking your wine. <laughs> Can you imagine? You, you go to a church. Hey, Josh, great to see you. Shabbat Shalom. You go to a church. Your heart is breaking. You're pouring your heart out to God. And the minister comes up and says, Ah, you're drunk. Stop drinking your wine. The text goes on. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a very unhappy woman. I have not drunk either wine or other strong liquor. Rather, I've been pouring out my soul before Adonai. Don't think of your servant as a worthless woman because I have been speaking from the depth of my distress and anger. Then Eli replied, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant what you have asked of him. 
So here's Hannah's gut-wrenching prayer, and it goes unheard, really, by Eli the priest. He recognizes that Hannah is speaking, but he doesn't really hear. He thinks he knows what's happening because he compares it to his experience of what always happens and that people may be drunk when they pray like that. But he's not curious about her. We see what we already know. That's how our brains work. They try to conserve energy, and you've heard me talk about this many times. Our brains try to conserve energy, and so they make judgments very quickly. Our brain's first priority is to actually keep us alive. <laughs> so if something happens that feels like a familiar threat, your brain doesn't really question what actually is going on. It simply says, I know what this is. You're going to die. You have to run or you have to fight. And this thought that you're in danger slips by and into the autonomic nervous system because you believe it to be true from your past experience. And this is oftentimes the enemy of curiosity. But, however, curiosity is to come out of that box of the predetermined agenda or the predetermined known. Curiosity is to come out of that box of the predetermined known. So what this means is that when we follow after curiosity, we have got to come out of the box. This is most likely most people think of Banksy um, uh, art, and it's really good because there's a wall here, and this person is, is pulling it back. And what's on the other side? And again, that's when we become curious about what's on the other side. So many of you know this, and you hear me joking around about it all the time, but I have a directional dyslexia. <laughs> uh, it, I have horror stories of my sense of direction. I am possibly the worst person, other than my sister Karen, who's as bad as me, that you have ever been with when it comes to direction. So taking two buses, over two hours with a transfer and a 15 minute walk trying to find Google Maps, initially, if I didn't understand what we're talking about tonight, could make me have a panic attack. <laughs> uh, before, I used to have a physical reaction that told me, no, you can't do this because you're gonna get lost and then you're gonna die. But curiosity has me observe those physical reactions and question that. So you know how you first you start to feel hot, right? And then maybe you start to break out into a little perspiration, and then your heart starts beating, and then you start looking around. Well, what are those reactions? And why are those reactions? And curiosity makes you pause and observe them and feel them and connect them. Is there anything really to be afraid of? Ryan and Anita were a little nervous for me too <laughs> with the bus, but I, I told them, you know, here's my perspective now. Look, don't worry, you're not going to find me three years from now in a cardboard box on a road called Jin Yi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the worst case scenario, I get out if I get lost and I call an Uber. That's why God invented Uber, right? I'm pretty sure it was for me first. And in curiosity, you are fully connected to the moment. So here's the really cool thing when you move from fear to fearful purpose to curiosity and openness. I'm going on the bus, the, the sign is scrolling with Chinese characters, and I'm trying to catch the stops, right? And so the stops are transliterated so that I can follow the stops, which sometimes they skip stops if there's nobody there, so you have to kind of be on it. But before, when I would be fear purpose driven, I would just be looking for the stops so that I could get to my ultimate stop. That was my purpose, right? I didn't care anything else that was going on. But now that I'm curious and open and not fearful, I realize, oh, maybe I maybe the sign was moved and I couldn't see it through the window and it scrolled real fast above. However, I'm noticing college students come out, a bunch of them. 
And so I see that the next stop is a college, and I look down the street, and I see a college, and I know exactly where I am. And I don't miss my stop because I'm connected to the moment and what's happening around me. And that's the difference between an open curiosity and a fearful, purpose-driven ride. Curiosity keeps you more connected to what is happening than being in fear, which disconnects you. I, I tell people when they get married this, <laughs> because they're sometimes really afraid. I say, look, you know, let that go right now. Do not miss one of the most important events of your life. Connect to the love, connect to one another, connect to your family and friends, experience everything that goes on. This is your day. Be curious about it. Wisdom requires curiosity along with humility. Watching your son become a father, my daughter-in-law, who I've known, I think, for seven years, honey, I think, if, if correct me if, if it's longer, become a mother and watch them grow together and love and care for their little girl in their own beautiful way is an incredibly overwhelming experience unbelievably emotional. I have never been on this path before. Nothing I have been through has prepared me for being a parent of parents and a grandmother. I thought I knew exactly what my purpose was in going to Taiwan. I forgot finding purpose and I began following curiosity. Now, there's a really cool Hebrew word uh, that's used in ancient texts, ancient scripture texts for curiosity. And it's called Hitlamdut, Hitlamdut. And it is a continual desire and openness to learn from all people and all experiences. Hitlamdut, a continual desire and openness to learn from all people and all experiences. And this is the kind of curiosity we're talking about. The ancient sages speak about this kind of curiosity a lot as it relates to relating to God or scriptures or your community. So let's look at Moshe, Moses. He's tending his flock in the desert. It's business as usual, right? That's his purpose. He's a shepherd. He's taking care of the sheep. It's in the desert. In Exodus 3, if you have your Bibles, you can follow there with me, verses 2 through 4, it says, The angel of Adonai appeared to him in a fire blazing from the middle of a bush. He looked and saw that although the bush was flaming with fire, yet the bush was not being burned up. So here's what was going on. It was the desert. Bushes burn up all the time, right? <laughs> Bush is caught on fire all the time. It's hot. It's the desert. There's no water. But what was unusual about this bush was that the bush was burning, but it wasn't being consumed by the fire. And in order for Moshe to notice that, to observe that, he had to look at it for longer than a hot second, right? So he was curious. He noticed it, even though it seemed like something he maybe saw all the time. He connected, and then he noticed that there was something different going. And the text goes on, Moshe said, I'm going to go over and see this amazing site and find out why the bush isn't being burned up. So Moshe is following curiosity. When Adonai saw that he had gone over to see, God called to him. So here's the really amazing thing. Look what the text says. When Adonai saw that he had gone over to see, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moshe, Moshe, he answered, here I am. What if Moshe never stopped to notice the burning bush? What if he never was driven by curiosity? We don't know. But it's very interesting that it says here that God called out to him when he saw that Moshe had gone over to see the bush. Curiosity is a connector to God, to others, to the planet, and to your own self. 
Now, my little granddaughter, and I promise you I'm not going to talk about her every week, is naturally curious. Even at just a few months old. When she gets a bit older, she'll continue with that curiosity. Now she's looking at her feet, she's playing with her tongue, she's looking at her toes, she's looking at her mommy and daddy and her aunts and her grandma and all that. But when she gets a little, a little older, it, it will even expand. And she'll start to make stuff from nothing. And she'll start to express herself through her body. Now, she won't say, you know, I really need to take some Lanco engineering classes or some dance lessons before I start to do that. So I don't make a fool out of myself and I know what I'm doing. She won't know her purpose, but she will move out of curiosity, which results in creativity and connection. Curiosity is a gentle spirit. It was curiosity that had the Magi following the stars to discover the Messiah. It connects us to God. One of my favorite authors that you've heard me quote so many times, Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel, writes, Never once in my life did I ask God for success or wisdom or power or fame. I asked for wonder and he gave it to me. Wonder rather than doubt is the root of all knowledge. And so tonight, I would love for us to consider forgetting about the passion, the purpose, the discovering, the finding of, of it all. Forget about that. Just lose that stress. And instead, follow after your own curiosity. Pause for a moment and be open enough to See the bush that you've seen a thousand times, but there's something a little different about this bush. And it's at that place that God wants to speak. Shabbat Shalom. I love you all. So good to be back. <laughs>